the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. That's the way to get church started this morning. Well, good morning. I hope everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you to Community Life Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, whether you're joining us in person or joining us online, I'm going to tell you, you are in for a treat today. Uh, the worship is incredible. Uh, Clay has got an incredible message. We get to hear from him for the very first time. This joker right here can get more words into one sentence than anybody else on this planet. So just go ahead and dial up the speed and get ready. I'm telling you, it is a great word, and I'm, I'm just so excited to be a part of this day. Uh, I'm Scott Verano. I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and I get to go to church with y'all today. So um, you ready, ready to get started? All right, so let's um, start the service off. We already started. Um, by praying the Lord's Prayer and getting our hearts on the same page, I invite you to do that with me today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. 
And we are so grateful, God, for the opportunity to gather our hearts together in this place or if we're joining online today, God, we know that your Holy Spirit just is so beautifully interweaving our hearts as we study and as we praise and as we just spend time together. Lord, there are people here I know that are hurting. And I pray that you would be present to them and that you would offer comfort and healing. There are people that are worried about things that are walking, that are going on in life and that they're walking through. And, and Lord, I think the greatest thing for us to know is that we can draw close to you and you are present to us in the middle of that. And so lead us through this service. Open up our hearts, open up our lives as we experience the living God in church today in such a profound way. We love you, we trust you, and it is in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Man, we are so glad you guys are here with us this morning. Um, I was talking to a friend this past Friday, and uh, he was asking me about our church. And I told him, man, there is genuinely no place that I would rather be on a Sunday morning than here with you guys. And it is, I'm so thankful. It is such a blessing to know that I can tell other people that our church is somewhere that God is present and that God is working. And I can say that confidently because he is. Amen. All right, let's keep worshiping. Yeah. 
over and over sometimes is because our mouth is saying it but our heart isn't believing it and so I think we really need to, to know that that God is for you he's on your side and when he's on your side nothing can be against you and I know that sometimes it doesn't look a certain way and it doesn't feel a certain way and you know what you got to do then is you just plant your feet as solid as you can get them and you just keep your eyes on Jesus and you just keep pressing forward and when you can't see you just call you just keep praying you just keep believing and you just keep standing firm in Christ Jesus Lord we thank you so much for your presence thank you for your blessings in our life Lord, for your sweet presence, for your love, for your continued grace, for your mercy, for so many things that we fail to recognize and to acknowledge you for. We're so grateful, Lord, we're so grateful. We love you. We give you back this day as Clay comes to deliver the message. We know it's powerful today, and so we want to open up our hearts to receive um, all that you have for us, God. So bless it and use it in our lives to draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping today. You can be seated.
Hey, good morning, church. Come on, how you feeling today? Cool, three of you, awesome, all right. <laughs> hey, can we give it up one more time for our awesome worship team? Come on, man. I love, I love our team here, and, and, and the people just lead us into God's presence. You know, God says he inhabits the praise of his people, right? And so I don't know about you, but when our team leads us, I feel God here, amen? Awesome. Well, hey, today we get the chance to finish out our Koinonia series, but before we do that, I want to just let you know some things that are coming up in church life. If I haven't met you yet, my name's Clay, by the way. Uh, I'm our Connect and Serve Director here, and I'd love a chance to meet you if I haven't got a chance to yet. And if I have and I forgot your name, I'll do better next time, I promise. So forgive me on that. But uh, a couple things coming up in church life I want you to know about. Um, Church Council meets on September 13th at 5.30, uh, 5.30 p.m., and so uh, we invite you to be a, be a part of that, or if you want to find out more information about that, let us know, um, but that is happening here in uh, about a week and a half or so. Um, fall sunset baptism is coming up. Sunset baptism, not sunrise baptism. We're shifting it a little bit. I don't know about you guys. Sunrise sounds great in theory, but I, I somehow in practice, it doesn't work for me. Um, I try and I end up hitting snooze and don't even know I did it. So sunset baptism's coming up on the 25th of this month, Sunday evening. Uh, it's a 6 p.m. over at Navarre Beach. If you are interested in being baptized or maybe for the first time or to rededicate your life to God, we want to help you. Signups are open and we actually have sign-ups available today in our next steps room out in the lobby. So we would love to help you with that. Our team's going to be there after service. Um, if you're new to church life, uh, a couple things to know. One is on the seat backs in front of you, you'll see there's a couple QR codes there. The one on the left says get connected. You can pull out your camera app on your phone and just scan that. Or if for whatever reason you're one of those really brave new people who sat up front, you can scan the one on the screen. Um, and But that'll just let us know that you were here. Just let us know a little bit about you. We want to send you a quick note. Just thanks you for being our guest. And um, But we also want to let you know that if you are new to church life, we've got something coming up for you next week, starting next Sunday. It's called Discovery, and it's a four-week class designed with you in mind that will help you discover a little bit more about who we are as a church, help you find your place in church, help you meet new people, connect to some of our team, because how many of us know it's not always easy stepping into a new environment, a new church, especially a big church like ours. So we want to make it as easy as we can to connect to you. And so if you want more information, you want to sign up for that, that is also available after service in our Next Steps room. So I think that's all I've got today uh, in terms of announcements, right? Am I missing anything? No? Good? Okay. You guys ready to dive into God's Word? No. Awesome. Not just yet. Um, so <laughs> uh, I want to let you know just a little bit about me uh, so that you kind of know who's talking to you today and, and, and everything like that. It's my first time I've had a chance to preach in four years, and so I'm super excited about it. Um, but if you, if you don't know me, it doesn't take you long to figure out that I am a huge sports fan. Um, we had some people from church over at the house yesterday and they walked in and it looked like Alabama threw up over our living room. Like it was, I'm an Alabama football fan. Come on, roll tide. That's right. That's right. See, where I come from, roll tide and amen mean the same thing. So throughout the sermon, if you like what I'm saying, just say roll tide. You know, that's okay. I'm good with that. Um, but um, I'm a big Alabama fan. In fact, the first game I ever went to, I think there's a picture of us. Yeah, that's, that's it there. Um, I was the A with the hat on near the end. Um, if you know Kat Seiler, who preached a couple weeks ago, her husband is Wes. He's, on, he's the M. Um, sorry, Wes, if you're in here. I dimed you out, buddy. Um, but that was a, it was cold. That was October. But we painted up front row. We were on CBS uh, back in like 05. That was a fun game. I'm a, no, no doubt our fandom was on display there. I'm a big Alabama fan, right? I'm a fan of like all sports. Like I love everything. Like one of the first dates my wife and I went on after we got married, we went out to a lunch date at Chili's and she got mad at me because I kept not paying attention to her and looking over her shoulder at the lacrosse game that was on. She goes, okay, I draw the line at lacrosse, Clay. I draw the line there. You can have football and basketball, but lacrosse, no. Um, so I'm a big sports fan. I'm a Cubs fan. I lived in Chicago for a number of years. When the Cubs won the World Series in 2016, I went nuts. They, the first time they'd won in 108 years, there's still a white mark on my Cubs hat from when I threw it across the room. I was so excited, and it hit the wall, and there's a white mark on it. And I'm pretty sure the first week I was on staff here was when our staff went to drive conference back in the beginning of May. And I'm, I, I don't know if they'd admit it, but I'm pretty sure most of our staff was like, who did we hire? Like, Scott, what did you do? I think Scott was sitting there like, I don't know. Um, because the Memphis Grizzlies were in the playoffs that week. And so every night at the house we were staying at, I always had my Grizzlies jersey on down in the basement, running around, going crazy and yelling at the TV and going nuts. And so um, I love sports and I'm a huge sports fan. Um, and so 
if you ask me kind of what my favorite sport was out of all of that, I would say it was basketball. And that's because back in the late 90s, I kind of I made a basketball team that would really kind of change my life in a lot of ways. Uh, I was in eighth grade, and up until then, I'd played basketball a lot, but always like in rec league, like YMCA or church league. And that was fun, and that was great, but it, it, the level of competitiveness after a little while kind of tapered off. And I really wanted to get into something more competitive. And so instead of like trying out for the school team, I decided, oh, I'll just go for the AAU team, which was like the next level up because that's really smart. Um, and so I decided to do that, and somehow I made the team. I made the team, uh, only white guy on the team, so you guessed it. Rode the bench, baby. That's right. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm proud of that. <laughs> but uh, I, I loved being on that team. And I learned so much that year on the team. I, I learned more about the game and the X's and O's. I, I, I developed better fundamentals and footwork and, and really grew in my knowledge of the game. And I loved that I made the team. But really, by the end of the year, I kind of wasn't feeling it because I just rode the bench. And it was great cheering my teammates on. But after a while, I'm like, man, I've been to practices all the time. I'm not playing. I might as well just be in the stands. Um, and so I, I decided after that first year that if I made the team in year two, I wanted to get on the court. I wanted to start making an impact. And so that whole offseason, I busted my tail, man. I mean, I was everywhere I went, I took a basketball with me. I was like at church, basketball, like I had to make sure I didn't drop it in the middle of the sermon, right? Like it, right, at least we didn't have it in a gym like this. Uh, that would have been tempting. Um, but had that, had that with me all the time. We were at grocery store, basketball, heading head to school, basketball, going to the movies, basketball. At night in bed, I fell asleep every night in bed with my basketball. You know, some people said it was an obsession. I called it a hobby, but, you know, whatever it is. And so I loved the game. And by year two, I was ready, and I made the team again. And wouldn't you know it, I started to get into the regular rotation. I started making an impact. And that team allowed me to do things that being a fan never would have. Like, I got to share the court and play against guys on the same court and match up and guard guys that are like NBA MVPs now and NBA champions and also guys are going to be in the Hall of Fame. Now, I wasn't that good. That's why I'm here. Um, but uh, they were that good. And I got a chance by being on the team and by getting into the game, I got a chance to, to have these experiences that I never would have had. I got to play in NBA stadiums and it was just amazing. And, and I really think that the being on the team took me further than being a fan ever could. You know, I love being a fan, but there's nothing like being on the team. And I really believe that doesn't just apply to sports, but that applies to life, and it applies to our life in church as well. You know, I think in America, you look, and there, there's no shortage of a passionate church fan base in America, right? Like, we've got people who love church. Like, we've got people who, man, they, they buy the church merch and wear the shirts and the jerseys, and they show up to the games on Sundays, right? Like, they, they support and they worship, and they're passionate fans of church. But I really believe that while we have an incredible fan base, we have a shortage of people who are on the team making an impact. And that's not a new problem. Jesus had that problem, right? He said the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few, right? And so, that, hey, we're being Christ-like. We don't have enough people. Cool. Um, you know, right? So that's, that's the reality of it. But, um, but there is a shortage of that. And if that's you today, please hear me on this. It's not designed to make you feel guilty or bad that you're not on the team or, or try to rope you into something. But I believe this when it comes to being engaged and serving in church life, that God always wants more for you than he wants from you. God always wants more for you than he wants from you. And I believe that if you are going to live the life God's called you to live, you will never live it to the fullest without engaging into your purpose and starting to serve, that God wants something for you in that. You will not fully experience the life God has for you and the purpose God has for you and the impact he wants to make through you when you're only on the sidelines. And so today, I want to talk about being part of the team. We're closing out corn in the end. We're talking about serving. And if, if today's message had like a subtitle, it would be, put me in, coach. Because that's what I want us to leave today with that idea of like, okay, I'm ready to take that step. So are you ready with me? We're going to dive into God's word a little bit, okay? And see what God has for us. Our primary scripture for this whole month has been found in, chap uh, in chapter 2 of Acts. The book of Acts, the Apostle Luke wrote the book of Acts, and we started this a few weeks ago, and there are a few key characteristics when it's talking about the early church that are really profound, and that's really, they, they are the model for us as a church here at CLC. And so I want to dive in and just see these and remind ourselves of these, right, as we've been talking about them the past few weeks. In Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, it says, they, meaning the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I love Luke. Luke. Luke, when he wrote this, I love that Luke gives us the results, right? Like, I'm a results-driven person. Like, tell me all about the method, but I want to see, does it work? And Luke points out what the early church did, and then he says, and it was added to their number daily, those who were being saved, right? And so, within these verses, we can clearly see a few distinct characteristics of the church, um, three of which we've talked about the last few weeks, that really give us the model for what we are as a church at CLC. And so we're going to di- look at back at those for, for a second. The first thing we see is they were committed to large group worship. It says they gathered together in the temple course. This is why gather is one of our four pillars of a church. We, we value Sundays. We believe success starts on Sunday. Um, you know, Sundays we preach the gospel. We let people know about who Jesus is. We're reminded of God's love. Um, in fact, studies show that 80% of adults who make a decision to follow Christ as an adult do so as a result of attending a church service on a Sunday morning. And so gathering is so important because there's just something that doesn't happen anywhere else that happens when you gather with God's people in God's presence and are reminded of God's promises. And so we value Sundays and we value to gather. The second characteristic we see of the early church is that they were committed to small group fellowship. It says that they met together in their homes, right? And so they, they grouped. And Cad Siler delivered a great message a couple weeks ago on the importance of being a part of a group. You need people in your life. You can't do life alone. Even if you're an introvert, don't be scared, but that's the reality. You can't do life alone. You need people in your life. Whether you like people or not, you need them, right? And so we need people in our lives, um, you know, Sundays is a great place to to commit to God and to hear more about his word, but it's not the primary avenue for growing and developing your faith. That's where groups come in because real life change happens through real relationship. And our groups are designed to foster authentic Christ-centered relationships that will help you move forward in your life and in your faith. And so we want to see people take the step and be part of a group. The third characteristic we see in in this chapter of Acts or this verses of Acts is that the church was committed to practicing generosity says they sold their possessions to give, right? And so we, we value giving. Pastor Scott talked about it last week. He talked about his favorite verse, right? John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave, right? And so if giving is the nature of God and we want to follow God, then we want to step into that giving. And so we value generosity and practicing generosity. And you got a handout last week, and if you weren't here, we've got some in the lobby for you that showed you this is what we do with your finances. We want to be open and transparent and honor your generosity because the reality is Proverbs says it, the world of the generous grows larger and larger. And so as we give and as we invest, our impact in our world for Jesus continues to expand. And so we want to be a part of giving and practicing generosity. And then the last characteristic we see in this chapter or this, these verses about the early church was they were committed to making an impact. It says they identified anyone who had need. So they were serving within that koinonia, within the community. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. Um, This is where we get a chance, just like the early church did, to say, hey, put me in, coach. So we're going to dive in in the next few minutes to a few different areas of Scripture, both Old and New Testament, because the reality is, as I was looking at this, there's not just one great story. All throughout Scripture, there's evidence and stories and teaching on the fact that God's people serve others. So are you ready? Buckle up. I talk fast and I move a lot, all right? But bear with me and hold on tight, all right? Here we go. We're going to start in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn there, you can look on the screen. And a little background on Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet of God, and a prophet was somebody God would call, and he would give them a message to deliver to God's people. And so he calls Isaiah and gives them a message to deliver. And in chapter 6 of Isaiah, Isaiah writes and he recounts this encounter he had with God when God called him. And so this is what Isaiah said. He has this vision of God and he encounters him. And he says this in chapter 6, verse 1. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying, and they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. 
I can't imagine being there. Like, that would have freaked me out. And it did Isaiah too. He says, Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. I love this scene about Isaiah because he has this encounter with God, and it's not just an encounter where God calls him, but it's really a picture of salvation prior to Christ coming to earth, right? Because when Christ saves us, our guilt is taken away and our sin is atoned for, and that's what happens with Isaiah. So not only does he have this calling encounter, but he has a salvation encounter with God, and immediately after having the salvation experience, he hears God asking who can take the step to serve. And I think so often in terms of church life, and in terms of the Christian walk, we view salvation as the end game, as the destination, when in reality it's just the starting point. You know, a lot of times I know I'm guilty of it too, that we'll, we'll, it's like, man, if I can just make sure I get my kids saved or my family saved, or if I get saved or I can get my coworker or my neighbor saved, you know, then, then I've, got, I've done what I'm supposed to do. But the reality is being saved isn't the end game, it's the beginning. So when we take the step into relationship with Christ and salvation, it is a starting point. Otherwise, we just get saved and just go out and do whatever we wanted because we're like, cool, I'm saved, I'm good, I'll see you in heaven, God. Peace, like, and we'd be done, right? Why would we even be here at church? But that's the reality is that being saved is the starting point. God doesn't just save us and redeem us for eternity. He redeems and saves us for a purpose and an impact now and to have influence in the here and the now. Um, Jesus is a great example of this, Right? I mean, Jesus is our greatest example of this, right? And this is, this is our kind of first area we want to we hit on because Christ was a servant. Christ was a servant. Jesus did not come just to save, but to serve. And we see this because of the way he describes himself and the way Paul describes him later in Scripture. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is with his disciples, and he's with this crowd of people, right? And a couple of the disciples, their mom comes up to Jesus because, you know, she's trying to be like Mama Bear and help her kids out, right? And it's like, hey, Jesus, like, you know, when you go to heaven, like nudge, nudge, wink, wink, can you make sure my sons like get a good seat at the table, right? Like they can sit next to you when you're on your throne, like on your right and left, and they can have good position and power and influence. Come on, Jesus, like help, help a mother out, right? Like, you know, she's like sitting there talking to him, right? And so Jesus, the way he responds, is he gathers his disciples and he begins to teach them. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 26. Jesus says this, he says, Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus didn't come just to save, he came to serve right? And Jesus exemplified that. And Paul echoes this when he writes to the church in Philippi to instruct the church on how they should live in response to who Jesus is. If Christ is a servant, then this is how we operate as a church. And so Paul writes to them in Philippians chapter uh, one or chapter two, verse one, he says this to the church, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as who? Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found as appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so if we have committed to follow Christ, if we we're say, hey, I'm a Christian, which that break that word down, it means Christ-like, then that means in a relationship to serving in our church, we follow in the, the footsteps of Christ. We have the same mindset as Jesus, that we are committed to serve. We, the few characteristics we see about Jesus is that he served others, right? He regarded others as better than himself. He emptied himself out for others. He humbled himself. And so we're called to have the same characteristics. You know, I heard a pastor joking around one time, and he said, you know, sometimes I joke about what I would do if it was my last day on earth, right? 
Like anybody ever think about that? Like you think like, oh, I would go sponge, bungee jumping or I'd go skydiving. or I'd eat all the junk food because you know what? Who cares? I don't care about the secret anymore. I'm going. Die young, make a pretty corpse. What's up? Uh, and so he, you know, he joked about this, right? And he, would say, he said that. And he's like, sometimes I joke about it, but the pastor went on to say, he said, but then it hit me. Jesus knew and he washed feet. If we want to be like Christ, then serving is essential because saved people serve people. Saved people serve people. And you may be sitting there like, okay, that's great, Clay. Like, we serve people. That's awesome. Like, hey, this week I helped this lady carry her groceries to the car. Hey, I bought somebody coffee this week in Starbucks. Or, and that's awesome because we're called to serve everywhere. We're called to take the message to the world. But there is a specific arena in which we are called to serve, and that is the church. And, and God, through his word, calls us to be engaged in the mission of the church. And so that's the next part that we're going to look at in Scripture because the reality is when it comes to church, you have a part to play. You have a part to play. Some of you guys were just like <gasps> tensed up. It's okay. It's not scary. Just, just stay with me here. Paul, when he's writing to the church in Corinth, this is a theme, right? Paul, most of our theology comes from Paul writing to churches, right? And this is where we're sticking through today. When he writes to the church in Corinth, he writes to them in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians about their role as it relates to being a part of the church. And he uses this analogy of the human body. And this is where we get that term, the body of Christ, right? And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, and this is what he says. He says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, and all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it wouldn't stop being part of the body. And if the, eye, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it wouldn't stop being part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body, so the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there would be no division in the body, but that its parts would have equal concern for each other. And if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you, speaking to the church, are the body of Christ. And each one of you individuals in the church is a part of it. I, I don't know about you, that's the kind of koinonia I want to be a part of. I mean, could you imagine, and so many of us in our church, so many of you do so well with this already, but could you imagine if every single Sunday morning, every person who walked through the doors came in with the idea that I want to make sure somebody else's need is met? I mean, how special would that place be I mean, the reality is all of us would have our needs met, right? Because everyone would be looking out for each other. Like, that's, that's the koinonia we aspire to as a church. That's what God's called us to. And I think a lot of times we get in this comparison game, like it said, like Paul was writing, we're like, oh, I'm not the head, or I'm not the eye, or I don't have a place because I'm not that. Like, we'll, we'll look at, like, Tammy, and like, oh, I can't sing or, and lead worship like Tammy or Kyle, and so I don't have a place, or I can't preach the way Scott or Clint or, can do, and so I don't have a spot, or I didn't go to Bible college, or I, didn't, I can't organize small groups. Or, and so we start to disqualify ourselves from ministry, but the reality is, is your value to the body is in being part of the body, not in comparison to the other body parts. Like you've got value just because you are you and because God has put you here on purpose and with purpose and for a purpose, God has something for you. And a lot of times we'll do that. We'll disqualify ourselves. But I think about who did God use throughout scriptures, right? Like throughout the history of the world, when God used people, it was very rarely, if ever, somebody who we would consider qualified. Like I think about Hebrews chapter 11. It's kind of like known as like the hall of faith chapter, right? Where the writer of Hebrews goes down the list of all these people God used throughout history. And, and a few of the people he mentions, just, I mean, let's think about it. Abraham, right? Doubted God's promises and took matters into his own hands, right? Or how about Jacob? He deceived his father and stole his brother's birthright. Or how about Moses? He murdered somebody and then was fled and was a fugitive on the run. And he also had a speech impediment, right? Or, or how about Rahab, a prostitute? Don't worry, I'm not going to say anything more about that, Scott. Um, but uh, how about Gideon, a coward, right? Or how about David, an adulterer and a murderer? The point is this, is if you feel like you are unqualified to serve in ministry, I've got really good news. You're in great company. 
<laughs> You're not the first one. And the reality is, what you may think disqualifies you from serving may actually be the thing that God wants to use to impact somebody else. What you think could do that, don't let your past disqualify you from God's future for your life. Because there is something, there is still purpose that God has for you. You know, a lot of times we, we like to hear the wins in faith, right? The victories. And we can celebrate someone's victory, right? But we'll connect with somebody's scars. I don't know about you. That's how I connect. I want to hear what you came through, not just what you accomplished after you got there. And, and the reality is this. Hear me on this. Sometimes what you've been through may lead to somebody else's breakthrough. Let me say that again. Sometimes what you've been through could lead to someone else's breakthrough. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, I need you to serve. All right, now turn to the other one that you just ignored, even though it's kind of awkward now, right? And say, hey, you may be my breakthrough. <laughs> Come on, what you've been through could be somebody else's breakthrough. The reality is this, is there is somebody that's going to walk through our doors, it may have even happened today, that is going through something and is dealing with something in life, and they need to know that there's somebody else here who knows what they're going through and who's come out on the other side of it, and they can see that, guess what, God's not done with me yet, that there's still hope, that I can still have purpose, that my life's not over. You need to serve because they need to know somebody like you exists. They need to know that God has still not done yet. So God needs you to serve, the church needs you to serve because what you've been through can lead to their breakthrough. I've heard it said, and I so believe it's true, that God does not call those who are qualified. God qualifies the ones he called. So the answer isn't, what are you qualified to do? The answer is, are you willing to do something? That's the response God's looking for, and God will take care of the rest. God is faithful in that. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're like, okay, cool, Clay, like, okay, I have a part to play, but I don't know what that part is. That's okay. That's point number three. We got you. <laughs> the church is here to help you develop as you serve. That's what the church is here for. You know, growing up in church life, I always looked at like the pastors and the staff and stuff. And like, I always thought like their job was to do all the ministry because they're on staff. And to an extent, that's true. I mean, if you hire somebody to do a job, you expect them to do the job. Um, but as I've grown and as I've matured and as I've read more and more scripture, I've realized that that is not the primary role, role of church leadership. Um, the primary role of church leaders is not to do the work of the ministry. The primary role of the church leaders is to equip the people to do the work of the ministry and to have impact. And we know that because, again, going back to our friend Paul, right, when he writes to the church in Ephesus. You know, we talked about that, Pastor Scott, last week uh, when Paul was at the church of Ephesus. And as he left them, he said, I may never see you again. But Paul didn't forget him. He wrote back to them. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes to them as it relates to this element of the church. And he says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He says, these are the gifts that Christ has given to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to do all the work of the ministry so that you guys can show up on Sunday and kick it. No, I'm sorry, my bad. That's, that was what I used to believe. Um, <laughs> it says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church. And here we have that term again, the body of Christ. And so we have an incredible staff here at CLC. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Like we've got an amazing staff and our pastors, our leaders... I mean, just in the, shoe, the, the few short months I've been here, I've seen our staff pull off some incredible things. I've seen them throw together funerals that were unexpected, and I've seen them minister out into the community to people who had need. I've seen missions trips overseas happen, and I, the VBS that like almost 700 kids were in here, and it was just utter chaos, but somehow awesome at the same time, right? And like our staff can put things together, but if our impact is limited to only what our staff can do, then our impact will be limited to only what our staff can do. And I believe that if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, to be, then it is going to take all of us to be active participants and engaged in the mission of the church. And we know our mission, right? We say it every week. Come on, you can say it with me. We love God, we love our neighbor, and we connect people to Jesus. Our mission is so clear and it is so theologically sound and scripturally based, but it takes us all to be engaged in that mission and to take that step to be a part of it and participants in an active role, not just to know it. So we've got to take the step to be engaged in the mission. And we as a church and the staff and the leadership are here to help you discover the impact in the ministry God has for you in that. And our goal, hear me on this, our goal is not to get you serving on a team to fill a spot and complete a task. Those are the results of serving 
But that's not the goal. The goal for us is to help you take that step in your life and in your faith and in your following Jesus because that's when you begin to thrive more than you ever have in your faith. There is nothing like serving in God's house that helps elevate your level of faith and your relationship with God. Nothing can replace that. And we want to see you thriving and growing. One of our values here is transformative faith. And we want to see that happen in your life. And that happens through serving. That happens through serving. There is, there, we want to see you experience this unparalleled joy that happens when you are participating in the life of the church and you help connect somebody to Jesus. There is nothing else like it. There is no better feeling than doing that. And so what, is, what does that mean, right? Well, well, serving in God's house is our avenue to live into the purpose God has for us. You know, so often in my life in, in church and serving on staff at different places, I've heard people ask the question over and over, what is my purpose? I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and, 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 and I mean, I saw the statistics always on the rise with students of depression and self-harm and all these things. And, and so often it was attached to, I just don't even know what I'm here to do, so why should I be here? And it is a great question in our world, and yet God lines it out so clearly that we have purpose in our lives. It's one of the greatest gifts God gives us as his followers. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes to that church again in Ephesus, and he says in verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And our worship team is going to make their way back up now as we, as we close out, but maybe you've been thinking and you're, you're sitting there like, okay, I don't know how I'm gifted though. I don't know what role am I supposed to play. I, I'm not, I know I'm not the foot, but I don't know what I am, right? Don't let that stop you from joining the team. Now, Pastor Rick Warren, he was uh, the author of The Purpose Driven Life, if you're familiar with that book. And if you've ever read it, I encourage you, it's, it's awesome. But he had this to say in terms of what it means to serve in church and about serving. He says, many books get the discovery process backwards. They say, discover your spiritual gift, and then you'll know what ministry you're supposed to have. But it actually works the exact opposite way. Just start serving and experimenting with different ministries, and then you'll discover your gifts. Until you're actually involved in serving, you're never going to know what you're good at. It is easier to discover how you're gifted through serving than it is to discover your ministry through your gift. And so don't let that keep you from taking that step to be a part of the team. We have so many opportunities here at CLC to serve and to be a part of making an impact. We've got our welcome team and coffee team and communion team and our cares ministry and our youth ministry and our kids team. And I saw some of you guys just twitch a little bit when I said kids. I promise that they're awesome. It's not scary. Like I got a chance to serve in kids and youth ministry for 10 years and it is the greatest thing in my life. Like it is some of the best things I've ever had happen in my life as a result of being a part of that because seeing the faith of a child come to life, there's, man, there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. So if you've like been on the fence about that, don't let it stop. In fact, let me tell you a story um, about the impact our kids' ministry has. I've got two daughters. Um, I've got a four-year-old, Bella, and a two-year-old, Ariel. And you've probably seen them running around here. They're crazy. <laughs> I love them to death, but they're awesome. Um, and we do our best as parents to try to teach them God's Word. We read Scripture at home, and we, we say our prayers each night. But we also know that part of our responsibility to them as parents is not to be the only voice in their lives. And we want to surround them and get them into environments and places where other people are speaking God's truth into their life. And, and so they love coming to church. Like, I mean, every single week, Bella will like ask me, my four-year-old, is church tomorrow? Well, no, it's a few more days. Okay. Is church tomorrow now? And it's just a couple more days. And then yesterday, is church tomorrow? Yeah. She goes, yes. <laughs> and so she loves being here. And we brought them to VBS that week. And and, and every single day since VBS, I kid you not, every day since VBS, I hear them singing a worship song at home that they learned from VBS. And then every night as we've started saying our prayers more and more, they've started asking, Daddy, can we say the prayer we learned from school or from church? Can we say the prayer we learned from Sunday school, from our class? And we, so we started adding in the prayers that they're learning here. And um, a couple weeks ago when Bella was in class, one of her teachers, they were doing like learning the body parts, doing head, shoulders, knees, and toes, right? Um, I'm not going to do it for you, so don't, don't get your hopes up, but you know it. Um, and the teacher asked Bella, she said, Bella, what's your favorite body part? And without hesitation, my four-year-old daughter said, it's my heart, because that's where Jesus lives. I have no doubt that our, our volunteers who are serving our kids' ministry are impacting my kids' lives. And so 
Don't miss out on the impact you could have for somebody else, like people have had for me and for my kids. Don't let insecurity or disqualification or, or a lack of knowing your role keep you from taking the step to start serving because there is nothing like being a part of helping someone connect to Jesus. There's no better thing you can do in your life than to be a part of that. Don't miss out on what God has for you in that because again, God has more for you than he's asking from you in that. There is a level of relationship and faith that God will take you to through serving that nothing else can replace. So please remember that serving as we follow Christ, it is not something we do. Serving is who we are. It is an identity as followers of Jesus. And so today we've got opportunities to engage in, in the different areas of serving. And, and our team is ready in the next steps room. If you're like, hey, I want to take the step and figure out where I can serve, we can help you sign up there. But you don't have to wait till you get out of service. Those QR codes that are on the seat back in front of you, that one that says get connected on the left, you can scan that and it'll take you and you can say, I want to join the team and click. And it'll take you to a place where you can sign up. Like, I want to encourage you to take the step today to engage in that. And our team's here, and we're going to take a moment and worship, and I'll invite you to stand. And this song we're going to sing, and we're going to, we're going to worship together, but this song is called Resurrender. And, and I don't know about you, but in my life, I know that I've, I've surrendered to God, but there are so often times in my life, again and again, where I've found myself needing to resurrender something back to God. Maybe I've taken back and maybe I've taken priorities and got them out of whack, or I've, I've held too tightly to my time, or, or I've... I've uh, not been engaged enough in, in reading God's word or prayer. And I've just, I have to, I have to come back to God and say, God, I just need to resurrender this to you. And so today that may be you, that may be where you're at. You may have felt like, Hey, I'm just in this place where I need to give something back to God. And, and maybe that's, maybe that's serving. Maybe that's prayer. Maybe that's, maybe that's something going on in your life that you've been holding on to trying to fix yourself and you need to give it back to God. And this is a chance for us to respond to who God is and say, God, I want to give this back to you. And so we're going to have that moment. We're going to worship together. And Pastor Scott and myself are going to be down here. We'd love to pray with you if there's something we can pray with you for. But as we worship, I just want to encourage you to have that in mind, that there is an opportunity for you today to give something back to God and to take a next step in your faith. Amen? Let's worship together.
not walking, we're running. God, we need resurrection. So we resurrected. Your calling, we're coming, not walking, we're running. God, we need resurrection. you've been in ch uh, challenged today. Um, I appreciate getting to hear Clay's heart. Can we give Clay a round of applause for just really preaching his guts out? Um, I love a person who can get more words into a sentence than I can, so I'm, I'm going to work on that. Um, and, and it's good to see Ashley back on stage today. Wasn't that awesome? And I miss Ashley and hearing her. Love her. Um, I, I love messages like this because it reminds us of our place in this world, that, that there are people all around us, including right next to us, that are broken and hurting, and we get the opportunity to be that conduit, to be that connector. And so when we serve, we put that flesh on, and we get the opportunity to be Christ to them. Not that we are Christ, but we get the opportunity to represent Christ in those moments. And so we encourage you to take that next step. Um, if you are looking for a way to connect in this room on the other side of that door, you can go out in the lobby and swing back around as our next steps room. I would love to meet you. Maybe you're here for the first time today. Um, I just would love to shake your hand and get to get to see you and get to know a little bit about you. Um, or if you're just looking for any way to connect, that's our way to be able to do that. Um, we pray you have a wonderful week this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we're looking forward to what you're going to do inside of our hearts and in this community. And God, I pray that this church will always be the conduit, not, not for Community Life Church, but for this community and for your kingdom. God, use us in the way that you designed us to be used. And so, Lord, we just avail ourselves to you. We love you. We trust you. And it is in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You guys have a wonderful week.